do you want to um, start with just introducing yourselves and, and what you do and maybe your history with, you know, some, any personal history with water in Iowa? Sure, well, I'll jump in first. Um, I'm Mary Skopek and I'm the executive director at Iowa Lakeside Laboratory, which is a Iowa Board of Regents campus in Northwest Iowa on the west side of West Okoboji. And we offer college classes, K-12 um, programming and classes. We do research and outreach on water quality. Uh, of course, the Iowa Great Lakes are important in terms of their recreational value and water quality is central to that. Uh, about $350 million in tourism uh, coming out of the Iowa Great Lakes. So hugely important. Uh, before coming to Lakeside, I spent time in the Iowa Department of Natural Resources as the water monitoring supervisor and coordinator, um, doing things like helping to develop a citizen science program to have citizens collect water quality, uh, the I water program, doing things like um, starting a, a wetland and lake monitoring program and have really been around Iowa's water my whole life. I, I grew up in Cedar Rapids and so um, spent a lot of time uh, personally around water and am excited to be here with you today. Yeah, I am Sarah Carmichael. I am the executive director of Iowa Rivers Revival. Um, we are a statewide nonprofit that focuses on education and advocacy for all of 70 plus thousand miles of stream um, that we have in Iowa. Um, rivers and, and streams are really important for Iowans and for um, visitors that, that come to Iowa um, to not only get out and, and paddle, but um, to also kind of protect and, and um, monitor kind of uh, how our rivers are doing. We get a lot of our drinking water in Iowa from rivers, so it's really important to, you know, protect and make sure that they are um, protected and funded appropriately at the state level. Um, we have a really close re relationship with um, Department of Natural Resources and um, their dam mitigation and water trails program. So we work on, you know, making sure that program is, is funded and um, uh, kind of restoring our rivers back to um, the way they were, you know, years and years ago. So um, before this, um, before I was, became executive director, I worked at uh, the Department of Public Health and kind of a different role with water quality, um, but making sure our, our drinking water was kind of at that optimal health. Um, but I've always had a passion for, for rivers and for water quality and making sure people can not only enjoy them um, through a, a public health perspective, um, but also being able to get out and um, recreate on, on those rivers. Um, my name is Kelly Schott. I'm the Environmental Branch Coordinator for the Meskwaki Natural Resources, which is a department underneath the Sac and Fox Tribe of the Mississippi in Iowa. Um, people always want to know what the Natural Resource Department does. Our department does the same thing that Iowa DNR does, only we do it on a federal level. Um, I've been here for 15 years, started out as a water tech, I've been Buffalo manager. And I'm the environmental branch coordinator right now. I oversee the um, basically anything that has environmental, like EPA, BIA issues, and we're working on establishing tribal water quality standards. We have a TAS and a full mature water program. Um, I don't know what else to. 319 wetlands. Um, I'm also p responsible for cultural outreach within the tribe. I feel like water and water quality. Be quality have been viewed more as an externality of agricultural production rather than, you know, a resource of its own to invest in and then, you know, get a return off of as far as, I mean, not just um, outdoor recreation, well, outdoor recreation for public health, for, you know, uh, recruitment and retention of talent, for, um, uh, you know, all sorts of community, community benefits. Um, and that's something we've been thinking a lot about is how do you change that perception uh, to get people to actually see these as something that can be, you know, economic and community drivers. Um, you know, first of all, I think people have assumed that Iowa rivers look today like they've quote unquote always looked, right? 
and that, you know, um, turbid, muddy rivers are a normal condition. And in fact, um, one of the things I used to challenge people is like, you know, so the name Clear Lake or Crystal Lake or Clear Creek, um, the names indicated what people saw, I think, initially. Uh, and we know through some historical documents um, that that wasn't the case, that Clear Lake, you could see the bottom of the lake and that, um, you know, in, in Eastern Iowa and Johnson County, some of the rivers were described as being almost like in Switzerland, they were so clean and beautiful. So oh, part yeah. of it is giving people the perspective of what could be. Now, we're not gonna go back to, um, you know, 30 million acres of prairie. However, you know, we can mimic some of those, those processes and, and get the rivers to be cleaner and healthier. And you're right. I mean, I think that we've seen a huge boom in tourism from kayaking and stand-up paddleboard and biking um, during the pandemic. Uh, Dickinson County saw at least a three to maybe five-fold increase in use of trails um, because people wanted to be outside and doing things. So as you build trails, people want to be on them. If we can link hiking, biking trails with paddling trails, we're going to increase that tourism reach. And so the investment pays off. And the more we can make those rivers and lakes cleaner, the more we see people um, gravitate to them you know, with economic value, as well as, as you mentioned, health and, and other well-being benefits. We've got water impacts the tribes on a different level than it does non-tribal members. And what I mean by that, um, people on the settlement, we have we have ceremonies, for lack of a better word, um, that we perform and we do. We have ceremonies that incorporate water, plants, and aquatic um, animals and aquatic life as well. So when we do our ceremonies, that water's got a direct contact with us as a tribal identity and tribal people. Whereas if you live in the town of Tama and you don't have that direct contact with your water, you, you pour it out of the tap, you may go fishing, you may enjoy recreation, but it's not a part of who you are or your life on a day-to-day -day basis. Within the tribal community, it is. Um, we harvest cattails and bulrushes to provide covering for the winter lodges. We eat the cattail roots. Um, we do the same thing with some of the bulrushes and the locusts, but it impacts the tribes on a much different and much personal level. So if the water is not clean, it impacts the cultural identity. Bulrushes are a prime example of that, and we kind of use that. Bulrushes don't tolerate dirty feet at all. Um, anything with heavy metals or toxicity within the water, we lose them. So we have to go off the settlement to harvest a traditional plant to bring it back to reinvest in a traditional cultural identity so that we can make mats for ceremonies. We, have to, we actually have an MOU with Otter Creek that allows us to go harvest cattail, excuse me, cattails and bulrushes at that property because we lack the bulrushes on this property. What projects are you seeing where communities are coming together to improve water quality or where you are seeing more of, of uh, an effort to protect and invest in Iowa's lakes and rivers? Right. In terms of, you know, Iowa's always been, I think, kind of a working landscape since European settlement. So it's highly uh, privatized. Most of the, the land is in uh, private ownership and the rivers and streams while cutting through communities goes through a lot of private land. And I think that that's um, that perspective of a working landscape and, and using the landscape to, you know, get rid of excess water um, so that we could drain the landscape to, to farm and, and for sewage and all that has been dominant. Um, I think once we really started to get citizens involved with A, understanding their water resources. So again, you know, I take the iWater citizen monitoring program. Once they started to do some of that monitoring, um, then they started to ask questions about, you know, why is it this way and what should we be doing to improve it? And we've seen a number of projects cropping up from that. Uh, one of my favorites was in Eastern Iowa, where a volunteer found uh, very high levels of, of phosphorus and bacteria that was really related to a community that was essentially unsewered. And everyone knew it was unsewered. Um, you know, the, the community knew more or less it was unsewered. And if you look at that, there wasn't a wastewater treatment plant, it was just the way it was. 
And it was really a citizen kind of bringing that to other citizens that got the wheels in motion and they got some federal and state grants to, to get that addressed. Um, and I think that model has worked pretty well. Um, no one likes the federal government coming in and telling them what to do. So getting citizens actively involved, I think is important. You know, you don't have to be a significantly publicly owned lake or West Okoboji for people to, to want to do improvements. And we actually had a discussion last night about some of the um, citizen lake monitoring. Um, Center Lake, which is in the middle of the, the Iowa Great Lakes, has seen dramatic improvements through some investment in wetland restoration, uh, runoff, um, urban best management practices. Um, that lake, which is sort of oftentimes forgotten, uh, has really undergone a pretty uh, dramatic renovation and, and improvement, which will you know, cascade into all the other lakes. So uh, I think we're seeing some good citizen involvement and some good projects happening. Yeah, um, and kind of just going off what Mary said, it's kind of when you look at water bodies, you kind of have that chemical component and that physical component. So chemically, um, what's in the water, we can't necessarily see unless it's like soil or sediment. Um, but that physical component, if, if a river um, is dredged or, you know, is, is straightened when it should be meandering, um, it's, you're, you're able to see that and then you're able to see the erosion that happens on the banks. Um, so making sure that kind of people understand, you know, a river shouldn't be straight. Um, we should have bends and curves uh, and, you know, a river shouldn't be dammed. Um, we do have a lot of dams in Iowa and it was used, you know, in years ago and that was important um, at that time, but dams are, aren't needed anymore um, um, because of uh, the uh, advances in technology that we have. So, um, so the way that we've gotten people involved is kind of really connecting with those cities and towns that might need those rivers restored um, and they're really, or, or might need a, a dam removed. And um, we're able to kind of connect with them um, and, and get everybody involved and excited about the possibility of what their river and, and their town could look like. And then not only are we removing the dams, but we're restoring it to potentially a, um, a uh, tourism opportunity. So if we're able to kind of restore a river back to um, a fishable, swimmable um, type of uh, uh, landscape, um, then we can bring in those tourism um, dollars. More people are going to want to come and fish and swim um, in those areas. I know a couple of places in Iowa um, have actually turned where a dam used to be into like a white water sport, sporting area. So that really increases the uh, um, recreational and tourism industry. And, and it helps communities of all sizes, whether it's rural or urban and um, I think that's really important when we focus on, on funding. Um, we're not just talking about the urban environmental or the urban em environment uh, and their rivers, but we're talking about Iowa as a whole when it's a very rural state. I wonder if, if any of the three of you want to talk about, you know, what's your, what's your favorite aquatic plant or animal or any like interesting mm -hmm. dynamics like that between indicator species or projects to, to work with certain um, certain plants or animals in, in Iowa waterways? We've worked, you know, a lot in the past with um, mussels and, and uh, freshwater turtles. Um, so all of those are really important. But when you think on a um, kind of uh, micro level, if you will, we also find that um, there are kind of these bugs, these water bugs that are really important to determine um, the quality of the river and of the, of the water body. Um, so Mary was talking about the kind of chemical um, aspect, but we also, um, we, don't, we don't do it, but I, as part of a monitoring program, um, it's also really important to look at those um, macroinvertebrates, those bugs, those water bugs and that we find in, in the water. So you go out and you sample and you see not only the different species that are there um, and that will help determine how tolerant 
um, or how polluted that river is determined on, on the indicator species that you were talking about. So you're not only looking at the number of species, but the um, how many of that species that you find. So you might find um, these leeches <laughs> that you might find one leech and leeches are, are usually in polluted water, um, but you might find a variety of other, um, you know, mayflies, stoneflies are really um, uh, uh, less, uh, less tolerant of pollution. So in, in all, in looking at the river, um, in all it it's, uh, could be, a less polluted river than what you would find in somewhere else. So Mary, you might know more about, about that. Um, I don't know if that was part of Iowa water or not. It, it was, and okay. it's interesting, Sarah. So to, to jump off on that, I mean, so moving up to Western, uh, Northwest Iowa and Okaboji, you know, one of the species that we used to look at is dragonflies, which I think are really fascinating as a you know, as an inverte invertebrate predator in the water in their early stage and then becoming a flying, um, you know, predator. And the number of dragonflies that I see at Lakeside um, is kind of amazing. And I'll sit on my deck and they're just swarming around. And I love seeing it because I know that that means there's good water around and they're able to proliferate. Um, and they're just super cool to watch because they're just crazy going after all the things we don't one experience. Um, and then on the other spectrum, though, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember when an eagle was a rare thing. And um, I've been, I'm still excited when I see an eagle in a tree. Um, Lakeside has an eagle's nest uh, near Little Miller's Bay. And it's so fun to see that enormous nest and the eagles sitting on that. Um, for me, that's a real testament to if we do common sense regulations and we make things better, we can bring these species back from the brink. And um, you know, my my kids don't remember not seeing eagles, so it's fun for me to be like, you know, I didn't use, I didn't see those growing up. Um, so both both kind of flying animals, I love. You know, the dragonflies and the eagles, and they're both kind of a really great success story, I think. Um, the other one is mussels. Mm -hmm. Mussels um, fulfill a cultural role in some of our ceremonies and within the Iowa River, you know, with the turbidity and whatnot. But yeah, mussels, I'm sorry, I'm a mussel girl. <laughs> I love them. Um, we just don't have that diversity that we historically used to have. And yeah, mussels are kind of my favorite filter feeder. I just love them. I mean, I don't know what it is. I get excited. My staff says, you got a box downstairs full of these old things. And I'm like, oh, <gasps> so, yeah. If we don't see the species, the diversity we used to have. Um, we've got a site on that settlement where the otters historically used to come up, and they would bring, and there's just huge mounds of mussels, old mussel shells. So we would go back down there, water goes up and down, and I'd pick up some of the old shells just to show what we used to have. And I think we've got maybe three species that um, go through the settlement because we've got three to five miles of the Iowa River that goes through here. We can only identify three species. That's sad. I think there needs to be a recognition that there's an inherent value to um, these, these natural resources and these ecosystems and the other um, organisms that that you know live uh, in these spaces, and you even think back to um, in a in a past life, I worked at a zoo, and I was in the um, I worked as part of the education department, and just seeing like so many kids come there and and learning um, you know learning about animals and learning about conservation, and you know. Uh, at least in my limited experience, kids love this stuff. And I guess, you know, I would probably all three of you have more experience with environmental education than I do. But I think that that's, that's an opportunity too. If you, if you get kids out uh, in nature when they're young, you know, that, that sort of imprints on them. I mean, growing up, going to Okaboji every summer, like that's another huge part of why I do this work now because, um, water and outdoors are, are really meaningful to me. And I think, Ingrid, you know, one of the things that, that citizens used to say to me is, you know, they didn't think there was anything alive in those rivers because they couldn't see it or they hadn't experienced it. 
And so, you know, I was paddling on the Turkey River and this mink ran along the river for a long ways with us. And he was not very happy that we were there, um, but I'd never seen a mink in the wild before. And so, you know, just because we don't see them because we're not giving our, ourselves an opportunity to see them doesn't mean that they're not there. And that also gives you a new appreciation. Um, that, that impact on me, um, as you indicated, you know, you turn a rock over and a student or a kid sees, you know, the macroinvertebrates or the critters running around, um, a crayfish, you know, those are really impactful. So the, the more we can get kids and adults experiences with, yes, it is alive. Um, yes, we've lost things, no doubt, with the muscles, but um, let's appreciate what we have and what, let's work to bring back those, those species that are valuable. Educational outreach is just huge. Um, we're working on developing a traveling trunk here because we can't go into the school rooms with COVID. Um, mm -hmm. so we're creating a, a trunk that can be utilized and even a virtual trunk. So we're in the process of trying to do that to our high school and our elementary kids. So it's, it, it's now with COVID, I think it makes us want to be a little more creative. And in being a little more creative, I have found old, <laughs> old programs that I'm, I'm recycling and bringing, you know, blowing fresh life into them by now making them virtual, doing videos or, or changing them because the technology has changed. Very much uh, my motto, I guess, if you will, is, you know, education is how we make change. So whether you're wanting to change, um, you know, what's happening to our landscape or what's happening in our rivers or, um, what have you, it's, it's about educating the masses, educating the public so that they can um, go back with that knowledge and, and, you know, talk to their parents about making a change or, or contact their legislators about funding something different or, or, you know, putting something else into law. Um, so education is, is how we do it. I remember uh, when I was in college, I actually took a couple of courses up at Lakeside Lab. And even though I had been up there um, over the summers, uh, my whole life uh, for our e aquatic ecology class, we went to, um, we would go to a wetland and collect specimens and then uh, spend the afternoon like using taxonomic keys and, and keying them out. But I had no idea that there were so many different invertebrates and, and all of these various, um, yeah, like cool plants and animals in these wetlands. Um, one of the things I pulled up was a fish eating spider, which I did not know existed. <laughs> and I was so afraid that I like dropped my net and like ran out of the, ran out of the wetland. And I made someone else go get my net. I was like, I'm not going back in there. <laughs> um, we have a whole generation maybe two generations that are afraid of nature because they've sat and watched, you know, the, the shark eating something or the bear. And it's like, that's scary. Um, and I think that that's a lack of competence to be in nature. So, you know, as Kelly would know, you know, the, the peoples that have been around for a long time knew what was scary and what wasn't and how to manage yourself in nature and that it wasn't scary all the time. Um, and, you know, I think that we need to get over that fear because the benefits are so amazing that we know that time in nature reduces blood pressure, makes you happier. Um, like I said, the, the three to five fold increase in trail use, people were just so stressed out during pandemic. Being outside was a, was a balm for that craziness inside um, their heads and in the world. So we just need to get people comfortable with being in nature and not, not feeling so fearful because of what you know, the Scary Nature Channel has, has shown you. We, we have people, it's a cultural taboo sometimes to approach the water and to swim. So trying to get and teaching people to fish, we've been asked several times, hey, can we bring the Iowa women on here? Can we teach fishing and hunting? And we, we don't do that because that's not a traditional woman's role. Uh, when we have to have a fishing class. We have to have the ma the males or the men, excuse me, in our office teach that because that's a, a man to man activity, not a woman's. So trying to teach people to come near the water, there's a taboo with the underwater panther and all these other things. So trying to 
bring those barriers and break them down a little bit without injuring the culture, but getting people interested in the water, the wetlands, the plants, the the animals, bringing back some of the old TEK. It's we have several hurdles that are kind of hard to accomplish to get over, and it's. I find that very hard in my job. I don't know if anybody else encounters anything like that. No. Really, and then, can you real quick? What's a what is the underwater panther? Um, in the Meskwaki culture, we have the thunders, the thunderbirds, and the thunder people, and then we have the underwater, which represent the underneath, the underworld. Um, just like in Greek, um, Greek mythology, was it you have, was it Haiti, which is down yes. below, or? Yes, that the wa underwater panther lives in the water, and if you see bubbling water, or if you're not a very well-behaved child or person, and you go around the water, the water panther will get you. <laughs> so a lot of people okay. are scared of the water, and so. And, but he lives in the underworld, and the thunders live in the above world. So there's two separate worlds. Well. I mean, I think I think water needs to be respected. You know, it is a very dangerous thing, um, but it's a matter of of knowing. Um, I guess the if if a river is flowing, kind of the flow of it. Um, but you know, dams that I mentioned earlier that we try to kind of eliminate, they're very deadly, um, and people might not see them if they're kayaking or canoeing, and so. Um, I I think it's a really big thing for people to respect the river and, and know or is respect all bodies of water um, um, because they, they can be dangerous. But I think it's education, you know, and, and showing that um, with the right tools and knowledge that um, anybody can go out and have fun and, and be a paddler or be a swimmer and um, just enjoy it. And I think those gender things are still kind of there. Um, so Ingrid, you did a solo hike and I'm sure you ran into people that were like, you know, oh my gosh, Ingrid's out there by herself, you know, this woman on the trail. So you have to, you know, that that still exists. Um, certainly there, there are dangers, but um, there is that gender norm that says, you know, women don't go out and do nature things by themselves. Um, and this has been a really great discussion. I really appreciate it. Um, and I just wanted to open up for if anyone had any, um, you know, closing comments on anything that we've touched on or anything that we haven't touched on that you'd like to, to highlight either from your organizations or just, you know, personally about water in Iowa. Well, I'm going to say we have, an, we have just started this. Um, we have what we have created is an Iowa River Watershed Coalition. As a tribe, we're moving forward with implementing tribal water quality standards, and we're looking at that for within a year, which means the tribe sets the standards on all surface water coming onto tribal land. With that, that can come with, hey, you're making me do, you know, adhere to these rules or whatnot. So we've been proactive, and we've created a watershed coalition. We have 64 both federal, state, county, local, and nonprofit agencies that have come to the table. 24 are active, and they're all within the Iowa River watershed. So it's just a fantastic group, and it's just something we're working on to improve the water for the Iowa River water. And I think that what people need to understand is the Clean Water Act and water regulation and improvement really starts with citizen knowledge and involvement. Um, and it's really important, you know, everyone became kind of a junior scientist under the pandemic, you know, we were gathering up that information, and reading about it. Um, I think it's important for people to learn about the science of, of water, not, not nerdy level, but just at the basics and to get involved. And, you know, every day there are decisions that are being made at the very local level, all the way to the national level. And so understanding those, talking to people, getting the information and participating is really critical. Um, citizens have a voice and should use that when it comes to improving water quality. Um, I will just finish off with, um, you know, I, in Iowa, we're, we're very uh, rural state. We have agriculture and we have urban development. And so there's a lot of key players in Iowa. And I think it really takes 
everyone coming together and, and having a seat at the table to really kind of come up with solutions to problems that we have as a state um, and just being willing to talk and discuss and educate um, and learn from each other. And um, if we're able to do that, I think we can, you know, come away with really um, achievable goals that uh, can be funded and, and um, projects that can be implemented. Um, it's just a matter of um, wanting and willing to, to participate in the discussion.